For those dimly remembered college nights when you are looking to buy the most alcohol for the lowest cost, there's only one old reliable that stuck around longer than both Four Loco and Beatbox combined. While it may not taste as good as normal beer, or even as good as terrible beer, as Billy D. Williams once put it, works every time. Today, we're cracking the cap on the history of malt liquor. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Food channel. And let us know in the comments below what other beverage history you would like to hear about. All right, let's pour this one out. In the mid-1900s, beer sales were in a decline. It was a dark time. As wine and spirits became ever more popular in the United States, the beer industry fought to remain relevant. As a Hail Mary attempt to regain their previous status, these struggling brewers repackaged a Depression-era beer for a more upscale audience. It was called Malt Liquor, and it packed a bigger punch than its beery counterparts. The malt in malt liquor refers to a specific process during brewing, wherein grains, usually barley, are heated and dried out in order to release the enzymes required for brewing. These grains are then mashed and soaked in hot water, causing the enzymes to release sugars. And the water turns into what is then known as wort. This wort is then boiled and, typically when making beer, hops and spices are added in to balance out the previously released sugars. Wait, wort and hops? Did the Battletoads invent beer? Whether or not, this is the part of the brewing process where malt liquor differs from traditional beers. If you're strapped for grains, you can replace the hops with non-grain adjuncts such as rice, sugar, or corn. These adjuncts will give the drink a unique flavor, and once the wort is strained, filtered, and fermented, it leads to a higher percentage alcohol by volume. They also make the brewing process cheaper, leading to lower prices once the drink's ready to hit the dimly lit corner refrigerator in the back of 7-Eleven. While malt liquors have probably been privately brewed for centuries in both North America and in Europe, its close proximity to all other beer-making processes can make it hard to distinguish from other lagers. For instance, an 1842 Canadian patent was issued to someone named G. Riley for an all-new malt liquor. But how close was Riley's concoction to today's malt liquor? Just like a bottle of King Cobra, it isn't totally clear. Historically, there hadn't been any firm rules to delineate between malt liquors and other kinds of beer, so it's impossible to know whether people were knocking back jugs of steel reserve in the 19th century. For the first known example of what we find in a modern 40, we instead have to look to a man named Clarence Click Korber. As the story goes, back in 1937, this Michigander brewed America's first ever patented malt liquor as a way to make stronger beer for cash-strapped drinkers. He called it Click's Malt Liquor, so he understood the importance of giving your malt liquor a name that sounds vaguely dangerous. Like all malt liquors, it was just a type of beer. But what set Click's creation apart was the dextrose he added in during the brewing process. The appearance of Click's malt liquor was soon followed by a Minnesota-based competitor called Sparkling Stite by Glick, a brand that claimed to be the true original malt liquor, with a label stating its recipe had been in use since 1847, although it doesn't say by whom. Maybe the Battletoads. Neither brand really took off, though, and it wasn't until the post-war era, during the previously mentioned decline in beer sales, that the idea of cheap, powerful beer was revisited. Country Club Malt Liquor was the first malt liquor to truly make it big in America, featuring in advertisements full of champagne, pearls, and tweed jackets. The goal was to create the perception of malt liquor as a rich man's beer, one that could be poured over ice and sipped on at cocktail parties. So would you keep the rest of the 40 in the fridge, or just carry it around with you to refill your glass? Country Club's competitors likewise tried to attract a wealthier market, with brand names such as Champagne, University Club, and Old English. Malt liquors were sold using the same strategy for nearly two decades, but the effort seemed to be in vain. The target demographic of middle and upper class white Americans just wasn't buying it. However, malt liquor had become unexpectedly popular in low-income black communities, which would trigger an all-out marketing blitz in the 1970s, as brewers completely changed how malt liquor was advertised. Because it had been sold as a rich man's beer for so long, malt liquor tended to be more expensive than regular beer at the time. 
Some speculated that this higher price point created a perception of quality that convinced people to try it out. Others thought that malt liquor's high alcohol content simply made it a more cost-effective way to party, which is the reputation it still carries to this day. Whatever the reason for its popularity, black Americans made up only about 13% of the country, but accounted for almost 30% of all malt liquor sales. Brewers took notice of this massive customer base, and they set out to make the most of it. So, from approximately 1965 to 1975, the malt liquor industry began bombarding those communities with advertising. At first, this meant shifting away from all-white cocktail party advertisements and towards ads that featured black celebrities like action hero Richard Roundtree and comedian Red Fox, along with ads that featured black couples sharing a toast with cocktail glasses full of malt liquor, still stressing the drink's refined image. But then, a certain malt liquor entered the scene, and the beverage's connection to black America only gained steam. In the early 60s, Dawson Farber was an executive at the National Brewing Company, whose biggest hit was the National Bohemian Lager. Seeing the ever-increasing rise of Budweiser and Anheuser-Busch, along with other national beer companies that threatened to put smaller brewers out of business, Farber knew he had to find a new niche if his company was going to survive. Yes, the people behind Natty Bo were about to make one of the most significant breakthroughs in the history of malt liquor. After performing some market research, he saw that Country Club was effectively still the only malt liquor game in town. That got him thinking, if he could produce his own competing malt liquor brand, it might give his company the foothold it needed to stay afloat. So, Farber came up with Colt 45. Believe it or not, the name has absolutely nothing to do with firearms. It actually refers to the 1963 Baltimore Colts running back, Jerry Hill, who wore the number 45. Farber then told his designer that the can should feature a kicking Colt, just to show customers the extra kick provided by the drink's high ABV, or in more abstract terms, the headache they would receive after finishing the bottle. While this technically violated federal law, which prohibits any imagery or words on alcoholic beverages that play up a drink's potency, the Bureau of Alcohol didn't seem to get the metaphor, and the drink's logo was approved without incident. The same couldn't be said for Colt 45's later spin-off brand, Power Master, which felt the full force of the federal government and was swiftly taken off the market in the 1990s. Power Master. Huh, could have been a little more subtle. Back in the 1960s, though, Colt 45 quickly became a national sensation. Like Country Club, it was at first marketed to middle and upper class whites, with Canadian comedian Billy Van playing a pivotal role in the brand's early marketing. Colt 45 had its share of advertisements directed at black communities during its first 15 years on the market, but it wasn't until 1980 that the brand began aggressively targeting black consumers. Fresh off the release of The Empire Strikes Back, Colt 45 scooped up Billy D. Williams to be its new spokesperson. At the time, Williams was the epitome of cool, and the Colt 45 ads played up to his suave sexiness, often showing him flirting with women or being doted on by supermodels while a gentle jazz piano plinked away in the background. His purred delivery of the slogan, it works every time, was the cherry on top. How could anyone not buy a bottle of those suds? As hip-hop music became increasingly popular throughout the 1980s, references to malt liquors in music became commonplace. For instance, in N.W.A.'s debut, Easy e specifically calls out his love of Old English. And N.W.A. and the Posse featured about half a dozen cans and bottles of Old English on its cover. That same year, an all-new brand of malt liquor hit the market, St. Ides a brand that would go on to form partnerships with nearly every major hip-hop artist of its day. In one of these partnerships, Ice Cube repped the brand by racing towards a bottle of St. Ides in a Porsche, only to flee the scene after by hopping into a helicopter. <laughs> it was pretty cool. Shortly thereafter, St. Ides then partnered up with Wu-Tang Clan, and the pair put together a commercial featuring Method Man, Raekwon, and Ghostface Killa, sporting St. Ides t-shirts and rapping about drinking. Even Tupac and Snoop Dogg got in on the fun. In one ad, the two sipped St. Ides while dressed to the nines, showcasing an upscale gambling lifestyle. In another, the notorious B.I.G. walked around Brooklyn, flirting with women and hanging out on porches, all while drinking St. Ides. This onslaught of hip-hop cross-promotion reportedly led to a 25% increase in all malt liquor sales. And it likewise gave malt liquor a prominent role in the 1996 comedy, 
Don't be a menace to South Central while drinking your juice in the hood. They say a rising tide raises all ships. And the same is true of rising tides of malt liquor. Old English also got a huge boost over this period, bumping their production from 950,000 barrels in 1989 to just shy of 2 million barrels just four years later. That might be enough for an actual tide. While many rappers and other recording artists have since moved on to rep all sorts of other alcoholic products, from gin to cognac to Cabo Wabo, the association between hip-hop and 40-ounce bottles of malt liquor was here to stay. This my name is Cobra Man and I'm audacious. Step up on the floor and show us what you got. Hey, hey, let's party. Tell your luck, I said, I said, step on the floor and show us. Despite the popularity of malt liquor in the early 90s, not everyone was on board with its targeted advertising. For instance, in Public Enemy's 1991 One Million Bottle Bags, the group calls out the damage heavy drinking has done to black communities, rhetorically asking how much violence has been committed after drinking down a bottle or a malt liquor six-pack. This came after St. Ides had allegedly used Public Enemy's Chuck D's voice without his permission, leading to a $5 million lawsuit against the company. In a later interview, Chuck D commented on the situation, accusing brewers across America of deliberately contributing to increased violence in poor black communities. And he wasn't the only one who felt that way. Many religious leaders spoke out against the targeted advertising as well. At the same time, a conspiracy theory began to proliferate suggesting malt liquor was a secret eugenicist ploy to lower birth rates in black communities. Many started to turn against malt liquor. And by the late 90s, hip-hop and malt liquor went their separate ways, with only a few older holdouts like Snoop Dogg repping malt liquor brands into the new millennium. In the years since, malt liquor has only become more potent. Malt liquors that were previously around 6% ABV, such as St. Ives, can now be found to have ABVs over 8%, making them a common go-to for poor college kids looking to get the most bang for their buck. All the while, the beverage has been in steady decline. While these slowing sales still secure the malt liquor industry about half a billion dollars every year, a Chicago-based market research firm found in 2015 that, nationwide, malt liquor sales were at their lowest point in nearly 40 years. Rather than throwing in the towel, though, Colt 45 took this as an opportunity to return to their glory days. In 2016, they brought back their old, reliable Billy D. Williams. 25 years after his last Colt 45 commercial, the new Star Wars movies tried this same trick. The 78-year-old actor was as debonair as ever, but not even his timeless charm was able to successfully launch the malt liquor comeback story. Eh, just let him try it again in another 20 years with J.J. Abrams. So what do you think? What's your favorite malt liquor? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other Weird History Food videos.